Well, one of the fascinating aspects of the ethanol industry today is that they're getting really aggressive about trying to add value to their co-products they're producing. It's not just a byproduct anymore. And so their cellulosic ethanol production, utilizing DDGs as a, a, a feedstock, uh, there's fractionation technologies that are occurring. And so they're, they're doing a great job of trying to add value to those products that could realistically do great things for us in the dairy industry. Hello, everyone. This is Luis Ferreira with the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. And today we'll be discussing the use of high protein corn co products in dairy calf starters. And in order to shed some light to this topic here, we have Dr. Billy Brown, which is an assistant professor with K State University. Uh, first, Billy, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm really excited for this discussion. Uh, but before we get into that discussion, please. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, thanks for having me here, uh, Luis. I'm really excited about it. And um, my background is uh, I didn't grow up on a dairy farm, but got hooked on it because I was exposed to milking at a young age on a, a de local dairy farm and just thought that was the coolest thing ever. So uh, I pursued a, a lot of activities, youth-related activities around the dairy industry, uh, decided to uh, pursue animal science and a uh, dairy science degree at Kansas State University and uh, then pursued some master's and PhD work uh, in dairy cattle nutrition at both Michigan State University and, and back at Kansas State University. And uh, when I wasn't pursuing academic pursuits, uh, I also had a five-year hiatus at the Kansas Department of Agriculture where we were working to grow our state's dairy industry. We were one of the fastest growing dairy states in the nation and uh, had an opportunity to really uh, kind of uh, promote what we're doing here and the positive aspects around dairy farming in Kansas and the opportunities there. So uh, all those things kind of uh, culminated and wound up uh, with me coming back to Kansas once again uh, and uh, serving as assistant professor here at Kansas State University in animal science, and I have a 60% teaching appointment and 40% research appointment. Awesome. Yeah, no, I'm glad you could uh, go to experience different places across the, the U.S. and then go back to Kansas and continue to contribute to the dairy industry there. So said that, today we'll be discussing some of your research. So to, to kick us out with that, tell us a little bit on how have corn co products being utilizing calf starters? Sure, yeah, great question. And uh, calf starters have primarily used soybean meal as uh, a protein source uh, in, in those products. And, and so if you look at the literature, it, there really isn't uh, any corn co products that are serving as protein sources in these calf starter grains really at all. Um, and so whether that's representative of the, of the entire industry, what's going on in different parts of the country, I couldn't really tell you that, but I think it's probably a representative of the recommendations that nutritionists make uh, for calf raisers and dairy farmers on a daily basis to really use those high quality soybean meal uh, protein sources in, in calf starter grains. And there's been a couple of research articles over the last 20 years or so that have tried to include uh, corn co-products in calf starter grains, namely distiller's grains, and had some varying results with that and not necessarily great results uh, in the long run in terms of calf growth and performance uh, and average daily gain in those calves. And I think a lot of that really distills down to uh, the higher fiber content of uh, the uh, brand, the corn brand that's in those distiller's grains, which is probably a little bit more difficult for those calves to digest in that early life period. And so it's probably kept people from utilizing those products as much as we have in lactating cows or heifer diets. Absolutely. I think that's a great overview. But Tell us now, what is unique about this high protein co-product that you are working with? Well, one of the fascinating aspects of the ethanol industry today is that they're getting really aggressive about trying to add value to their co-products they're producing. It's not just a byproduct anymore. And so their cellulosic ethanol production, utilizing DDGs as a, a, a feedstock, uh, there's fractionation technologies that are occurring. And so they're, they're doing a great job of trying to add value to those products that could realistically do great things for us in the dairy industry. So the specific product that we were interested in uh, is called uh, Protomax. It's uh, produced by ICM Incorporated, um, and they have headquarters here in Kansas. 
And uh, that product specifically has a, a 50% crude protein content in that product. So about the same content as a, a soybean meal. And so that kind of catches my eye when we start to look at those things um, and, and knowing that these are being marketed in, in the industry. I think there's a, a reasonable expectation that they feed similarly, but we don't really know that that's the case. Um, and so this product was uniquely made by uh, making a high pro DDG, which uh, involves some fractionation on the front end to get the corn bran off, but also taking uh, a lot of the yeast bodies and, and byproducts of those yeast fermentation products and condensing them and then adding that back to the uh, finished high pro DDG to really amp up that uh, protein a little bit more. So a little bit more yeast bodies in there probably than what we're used to seeing in traditional high pro DDGs. Absolutely. Well, I won't lie to you. 50% crude protein sounds tempting, you know, because even with soybean meal, it's, it's, it's very, very hard sometimes to find a soybean meal that has 49%. So you ended up with that 44 to 46% range, which obviously uh, it's good, but it's not as good. Right. right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Because you probably paid for at the 49% rate, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I have no doubts there. And uh, But when you work with uh, that range of um, crude protein, I believe that you have to be very careful also with uh, some of the amino acids that you are providing, right? So obviously, uh, the two key amino acids that we would think about would be lysine, methionine. So guide us through the process that you went through when you start formulating those starters uh, in order to make sure that you don't create uh, any imbalance or, or imbalance with the, the lysine, methionine concentrations there. Yeah, that's a great point, Luis, and I'm glad, glad you bring that up because uh, really when we think about those previous studies that have been conducted with calves and maybe they had some inhibited performance by including DDGs as the protein source in those diets, they didn't balance for the amino acids uh, in, in those uh, in those diets. And so uh, there may have been some limiting amino acids in those cases. And so uh, when we were formulating, we specifically tried our best uh, to uh, utilize the formulation program uh, and CNCPS model uh, to help us uh, at least meet uh, the requirements for uh, estimated requirements for lysine and methionine of those calves. And so we use a, used uh, rumen protected products uh, in, in that regard to help us uh, meet that estimated rumen protected um, uh, lysine and methionine requirement of the animal. Given that in calves of this age uh, and stage, that requirement is probably a little bit of a black box uh, in our models. Um, and so we, we have to have some trust there uh, in our models and recognize that it's probably getting us in the ballpark, but maybe not spot on. But at least we have attempted to balance for that and eliminate that bias from our study. No, I think that's great. And and let's be honest, right, uh, Billy, at the end of the day, the model is a model and you are actually testing with animals and they would not lie, right? So they will give you the true result and, and tell you exactly what you want to learn from that. So said that, tell us a little bit of some of the take-home results of your study, things that, you know, uh, people at home can, can start thinking about if they have interest uh, working with this type of co-product uh, co uh, and make sure that they reach a good uh dairy calf starter? Well, I think it's important to consider, Lee, that one of the first things that we want to do with this study, our hypothesis or our objective was to determine, you know, what would happen to calf growth, uh, calf dry matter intake, feed efficiency. And if at the end of the day, our feed efficiency and our growth was not different between treatments, that's great. Um, and that's fine. Uh, that's what we wanted to understand. And in this case, uh, we, we kind of expected uh, some uh, negative uh, results as a uh, part of including more of this high protein corn product in the diet. We actually saw the opposite. So calves on the high protein corn product grew more. They had greater average daily gain and they tended to eat more dry matter intake, but there was no evidence of difference in feed efficiency. And so that was really um, a positive for us in, in that regard. So we thought that was uh, a really nice aspect of, of what we uh, uh, found in this study. But we also had an opportunity to look at some uh, digestibility uh, results. So a 
total tract apparent digestibility. And so uh, the feed efficiency is nice, the growth is nice, but if it's not being digested the same or uh, as efficiently there, then we have a problem. And to our surprise, the high protein corn product diets actually had greater uh, total tract diger digestible um, and crude protein uh, digestibility as well. So um, uh, definitely some uh, digestible product that they're putting uh, in, in those products. Well, that's very interesting because definitely some of this extra, uh, let's say, protein utilization, if you will, probably contributed to some of this greater intake. And even though you don't have the efficiency, the simple fact that those calves are growing faster uh, or more, right, I, I do think it's quite relevant. And I think it's especially relevant because we know calves in the early life period, especially the milk feeding period, those that gain more weight during that period have greater lifetime milk production. And so a lot of that is going to come from the milk feeding program. But if we can also accomplish that through the uh, grain feeding program as well, even after that post weaning period for a month or so, that's a, a really big positive benefit for that calf long term down the road. Priority IAC, the only company bringing the fields of microbiology and nutrition together and the first ingredient in animal diets. Priority provides a more cost-effective and easier approach to nutrition. We recognize that not all bacteria are created equal. The specific strain truly matters. Priority IAC selects unique strains to provide the best performance in animals, and that's why we call these strains smart bacteria. Founded by Richard Brunig, helping to improve animal health one herd at a time. Absolutely. So obviously, the next question that comes to mind would be, are there any price difference between those diets? And said that, uh, even if there are some differences, uh, did this difference that you found in average daily gain compensate for that? Or I guess, in other words, what was the ROI of that? That's the first question that all our farmers have asked. And it's obviously the most relevant question uh, that we should be asking as well. Um, and I should say that anytime we do any of the, these studies uh, that that, that is important. We can't discount that. Um, my goal is to get the biology in place and understand you know, what happens uh, biologically speaking. And then when the market dictates, take out or include uh, certain products accordingly. Um, so at the, at the time of our project proposal, uh, which is a little over a year ago, uh, this product was actually being sold for about $5 uh, uh, per, less per uh, ton than what traditional soybean meal would. So in that regard, we think about the greater uh, gain, the greater dry matter intake. I think it actually uh, come out quite nicely. And even though we did supplement um, rumen protected amino acids in there and quite a bit of lysine in the 100% co-product uh, diet, um, even then we were coming out about six cents less per calf per day. Uh, uh, so that is a, a cost benefit for those calves if they're gaining the same amount. Yeah, absolutely. If you can get more weight and make more money out of that, I believe it's a win-win situation. I don't see how people at home would not be happy uh, with that. So, so Billy, thank you so much for this uh, very nice discussion. Before we end our podcast today, do you have any final thoughts or any next steps that you're thinking about to how to better utilize this uh, co-product? Yeah, I think we can certainly uh, uh, break out uh, some of the effects that we've seen here. I, I think one of the next steps would be uh, looking at what what's the uh, benefit to the growth that we saw, maybe from those extra yeast bodies that were included uh, in that product. And is that what's perpetuating some of the growth and, and added benefits that we saw as well? And what could be some of the health benefits to that? Uh, because we know they have uh, that has health benefits in cows and, and livestock and other stages as well. So I think that could be a next step for us. Uh, the world is our oyster at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm really looking forward into uh, what you're going to learn next and share with us uh, with your expertise. Uh, for you at home, thanks for joining our podcast and I hope to see you soon.